Good afternoon, everyone, and for students in the classroom and also students online. And if there's LOM students joining us, I guess good morning for those of you who are in different time zone. Uh, welcome to Peking University School of Transnational Open House. I am Keru Chen. I'm the Associate Dean for Admissions and Administration. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you. Um, it's STL's tradition to have an open house in every October. Um, this year, we move it to online and in person because of the pandemic. So special thanks to the students who come to Shenzhen and to STL building today. Uh, you really make a journey here. I understand some of you are coming from Beijing and Zhejiang, so thank you. Um, today, we are going to have an, a JD mock class. Um, we are very honored to invite Professor Rudolph to give this class in thoughts. Um, as you can read from the email we sent you, uh, this class will be taught in the Socrative method of teaching, so which requires intensive interactions between students and the professor. So we really hope that the students who have replied that they want to be called on, don't be nervous, get prepared. I hope you have time to read the short case we provided and the, essay, the questions provided by Professor Rudolph. Um, for students uh, in the classrooms, please silent your phone and make sure you have this little microphone if you are called on before you speak. And for students online, please mute yourself in Tencent meeting. But when you called on, please unmute yourself before you speak so that everyone can hear you and the professor can hear you. Then you can talk with each other. Um, our, usually our open house will begin by a remark of SDL Dean, Professor Philip McConaughey. He is on a business trip today, so he is unable to join us uh, in person. But he really wants to give a welcome to everyone. Um, so he provided a recording. Uh, let's see the recording first. Welcome everyone to today's introduction to Peking University School of Transnational Law, STL. I understand that both prospective JDJM students and prospective LLM students from around the world um, are joining us today. Welcome to you all and thank you for participating. My name is Philip McConaughey and I am STL's Dean. You all are aware that STL is unique in the sense that we are the only law school in the world um, that offers a dual degree program in both China law and American common law. But we also are unique in several other ways, perhaps distinctly so in the multinational perspective our faculty bring to the teaching of law and legal research. At STL, you will learn from leading scholars, both resident and visiting, not only from China and the United States, but from Israel, Egypt, Pakistan, France, Italy, Greece, Australia, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, the UK, and elsewhere. You also will experience life and law in what is probably the most dynamic and exciting place in the world today, in terms of legal and economic developments, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, and China's greater Bay Area. This is an area that seemingly overnight has emerged as a worldwide leader in technological innovation, internationalization, advanced financial services, and public policy experimentation. China's greater Bay Area is the most populous single metropolitan area in the world today, with a population expected to reach 80 million this decade. It is deeply interconnected by sophisticated communications, transportation, and energy systems that portend unparalleled sustained economic development. It is the world's gateway to China and China's gateway to the world including China's very significant Belt and Road Initiative. And our faculty bring these developments to bear in every class you take at STL, 
with actual case studies and deeply interactive class sessions that examine the causes and all sides of the legal issues that accompany the developments underway in the Greater Bay Area. Our objective is to equip all of our students with superior analytical skills, the ability to solve complex problems, both legal and social, uh, very creatively, and unmatched skill in both oral and written advocacy. You will get a brief glimpse of our approach to teaching law at STL in today's, <clears throat> excuse me, mock class session uh, with Professor Duane Rudolph. I will mention in closing what is perhaps the most important attribute of STL. We are a supportive and accessible community of scholars and administrators whose common goal is the success of all STL students. So welcome, welcome to STL and to today's program. I hope you enjoy the program and uh, give serious thought to a future that includes STL. Thank you. Thank you, Dean McConaughey. And now let's give the floor to Professor Rudolph. Good afternoon and welcome again to our wonderful law school here in lovely Shenzhen, China. My name is Duane Rudolph. I teach in the uh, first year curriculum here and we are so delighted to welcome you. You who come from all over China and from all over the world. If our LLM students are with us right now, they come to us from Ethiopia, India, Pakistan, Russia and Singapore among other places. So you're probably noticing that those of you at home, this is being recorded, that I'm not wearing a mask. We are aware here at Peking University School of Transnational Law that we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we do pay attention to local, provincial, and national healthcare requirements and guidelines. I have been tested, and so I'm authorized to teach this afternoon without wearing a mask. Okay, and people are socially distanced here in the classroom. I'd like to begin by thanking our wonderful Dean, Philip McConaughey, uh, the members of the faculty, the staff, and our fantastic students as well here at Peking University School of Transnational Law, with whom I love working. Um, I'd also like to thank the members of our admissions team who've made this possible. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Chen Keru, who is the Associate Dean for Admissions and Administration. Zhong Xiaojin, who is the Director of Admissions and Administration. Uh, and Tan Peihua, who is the Assistant Director of Admissions. They are among the many wonderful people that you will meet at our law school who work here uh, mainly on the fourth floor. Our fourth floor has some fantastic, fantastic people who make all our lives so much easier. And I love working with them, and I love working at this law school. So what will I be doing today? Today I will be showing you how I teach the first year course called TORT. You're probably wondering what a TORT is. By the end of this class, you will not only know what a TORT is, you probably may say to yourself that you know people who've been involved in TORTs, and maybe you yourself accidentally have been involved in TORTs. So, the case that we sent you, we distributed a case to you, is the very first case you will read on the first day of law school if you come to our law school. And we really would like you to come to our law school because we'd love to have you here. So it's the very first case you will read and you got a list of questions. Those questions will help you understand the case. We say that those questions will help you brief the case, which means put the case in your own words and prove that you understand the most important parts of that case. Because some cases can be tens of pages long, some pa cases can be hundreds of pages long, but you, as an attorney, must be able to take only the most important parts of a judicial opinion and use them. Realize and recognize what is relevant and irrelevant. So, my teaching style it, as uh, Dean Shen said, is Socratic. That means that I will avoid giving you the answers. But I will ask you questions. The idea is not to scare you. I know a lot of people who came this afternoon said they were very nervous, and probably a lot of people who are joining us online are nervous. Uh, 
But the idea is to allow you to internalize those questions. Why do I teach this way? Because someday I will no longer be your teacher. When I'm no longer your teacher, you must be able to ask the questions that I asked you when you were our student. You must be able to answer those questions on your own. If I give you the answers, all you will do is study the answers and give that back to me. That doesn't show me that you're a thinker. That doesn't show me that you're becoming a lawyer. That doesn't show me that you understand what you need to do without me. My job as your teacher is to help you learn the law so that you don't need me to teach you the law anymore. And so this is why I teach by asking you questions. Some of those questions are hard. Some of those questions don't have answers. But the goal is to encourage you to try. And that's why our wonderful students here pay me to teach them to try, to teach them to teach themselves, right? Because at some point, you will leave my class, and you must be able to do for yourself what I did for you. This is why I ask you the questions, and I don't give you the answer unless I think it's necessary to do so. It's hard, it's frustrating for lots of students, even very uncomfortable. But that's part of the education, to provide you with a safe space, not to scare you, not to make you feel angry or anything of the sort, to provide you with, an, with a safe space in which you can try. So, as Dean Chen said, we distributed the case and the questions, and we got about 70 volunteers, 70 people who said they wanted to be on call today. For this case, that we're going to spend about the next hour and 15 minutes discussing. Okay, so I'm going to start by calling on, I think it's, we're going to see, is Rosa in the room yet? Has Rosa joined us? Rosa, hi, we spoke earlier. How are you doing now? I think we're going to need the microphone so that we can hear Rosa. So I'm going to call on people both in the classroom and online. Okay. Rosa, how are you? I'm pretty good. Yeah, could you hold the microphone a little closer to your... Pretty so good today. Why? Because I like the climate in Shenzhen. It's also my first time here. Yeah, you were saying. So where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm so from Beijing. <laughs> okay. Your first time here? Yeah, first time here. Well, welcome to our law school. We hope Thank you, you love very much. law school and you enjoy this class. So yeah, I'm assuming you read the case. Yeah. What did you think of this case? I think it's pretty interesting. Why? Why is this case interesting for you? Because it's my first time met with a case with uh, the people who is just five years old. Good. So that's an important fact to keep in mind. This part of the story is the story of a child, right? A child who is five years old and nine months, right? Is not even yet six months old. Can you tell us other reasons why you might have found this case interesting? Mm, yeah, the, maybe the plot is very easy. Just what do you mean by the plot? Just the, the child, he, uh, uh, he moved the chair then another person failed, then maybe that's all. Right. Yeah. So it seems very, very simple. This is the story of two adults, a child, and a chair, right? So yeah. I sent you some questions. Let's work through those questions. Do you remember the first question I sent you uh, over email? It says, who yeah, sued who? Soon who? So who, who sued whom in this case? I remember Ruth Garrett. Soon, Brain Daly. Correct. So Ruth Garrett is known as the plaintiff. And why do we use this word plaintiff? Because the plaintiff is the person who has a complaint, right? So the person who has a complaint is called the plaintiff. The person who is sued must defend herself or himself or themselves against the complaint. They are known as, do you, do you know this? The def The defendant. The defendant. So the defendant in this case is Brian Daly, Brian and he is how old? Is five, less, less than six years. He's yes, less than six years old. Do we know the age of Ruth Garrett? Ruth Garrett. The adult, Ruth yeah. Susan, do we know how old she is from the case? Oh, I can't 
remember. Right, you probably can't remember because we're not told how old she is. <laughs> we are just told that she is an adult. Uh -huh. So we have an adult suing a child. So who sued whom? When did the adult sue the child? You're doing well, Rosa. You can relax and enjoy this. Good, you're <laughs> smiling. It is a day to smile. It's a beautiful, okay. well, okay. slightly chilly, okay. but you still okay. should come to our law school, which I love very much. So, slightly chilly. So who sued whom? When did this, law, when did this lawsuit happen? It's in 1955. So 1955, good for you. You've read the beginning of the opinion, says 1955. So that's when the decision, that's when the court wrote the opinion. The case had to go before the court before then, right? So it's probably in the early 1950s that this, so Ruth Daly, uh, Ruth Garrett sues Brian Daly in the 1950s. Where? Did you pick up which state this law, lawsuit came from? It says, at the beginning of the case, it says Wash. Oh, Washington. Washington. So Ruth Garrett sued Brian Daly in the 1950s in the state of Washington, right? So there are 50 states in the United States. So the law that you will learn in torts class is not always the law of every single state. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's only the law of a few states. So you know that this case deals with the law in the state of Washington, which is on the west coast of the United States. Why? And you were speaking about that earlier. Why did yeah, this Yeah, because the child moved the chair and Rose Garrett, she fell. Okay. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. Do apply to our law school. We'd love to have you. <laughs> thank you. We'd love to have you all. Okay, let's thank you. Thank you. Good, good, good. Let's move on now to Gloria. Gloria, I was talking to Gloria. Gloria, how are you? I'm glad you're great. So what did you think of this opinion? Yes, in Garrett B. Daly, can you use the microphone? So what did you think of this, what you read? What is your opinion of what you read? Um, I think there's one thing um, importantly interesting, that is the courts take the testimony of Brian instead of his sister. Um, I mean, the sister of Ruth. Right, so we know that uh, you're right. We know, so who sued whom? So Ruth Garrett sues Brian Daly in the 1950s in the state of Washington. We're going to come to why. But who's the witness here? We're told that Ruth Garrett does not testify on one point. We're told she does not, right? Which is interesting. It's Naomi Garrett who testifies, and we'll come to that a bit later. But why did this, so we had your colleague over here tell us exactly why this lawsuit happened. Can you tell us, there are two stories here. Mm. What is one story and what is the other story? What does Ruth Garrett say happened and what does Brian Daly say happened, right? There are two different stories here. Um, okay, according to Ruth, she said that uh, when she was about to sit down and Brian pulled out the chair from under her. Correct. So that's story number one. Remember that story. That is the adult's story here. The adult says, right, do you remember how many people were there on that day? Um, three. There were three people there on that day. Which three people were there on that day? Ruth, Ruth's sister, and Brian. Right. So Ruth, Ruth's sister, Naomi, and Brian. Do we know the relationship between Brian and Ruth or Brian and Naomi from the case itself? Um, yes, Ruth and Naomi, they are sisters. But do we know if Brian is Naomi's son, nephew, or anything else? Do you remember? Um, no. Yeah, we don't. So we can infer maybe that he is the son or something, but we don't know. Based on the reading that we have today, we only know that the two are sisters. And we know that there's a boy aged five years old and nine months here. So story number one, we're in the courtyard, which means we're outside the house, right? This is Ruth Daly's, uh, Ruth Garrett's story. I walked out into the courtyard and I was about to sit down when Brian Daly, who is five years old and nine months, does what? He pulls the chair away. What happens to Ruth Garrett? She fell and 
Um, she got a fracture of her hip. Good, good, good. Right? So she alleges that she falls and she fractures her hip. Pretty painful injury for anyone, right? This is an adult who falls and fractures her hip. So that's story number one. What is story number two? Um, the story number two is given by Brian, and Brian said that there is an interval between the action that Brian pulled out the chair and Ruth sitting down. And also, when he was about to like return the chair to Ruth, it is not in time, so that Ruth fell. Do you remember why he says it was not in time? That um, he was not on time to push the chair back? Yeah, because um, it's kind of Brian is small. He is little, so he is not limbo enough. Correct. Right. So story number two is I'm five years old and nine months. Right. What I did was there was a chair. Do you remember what the chair was made of? It's irrelevant. Um, it's wood and canvas it's wood and canvas so it's a very it's one of those chairs that's like that you sit out in the sun with right it's very it's pretty light this one is heavy brian daly could not move this chair i think i certainly can so his story as the wood and canvas chair right i she, she wasn't there so i decided to he's small he decided to move it and then he sat down and then he saw her coming and then he does that and he is so small, we're told the dexterity of his fingers. His hands are so small. And he is so small that he does not manage to get there on time. And she, she's over here, she falls and... Got a fracture. She fractures her hip. So you've got two stories. One from a child aged five years old and nine months. And one from an adult. Right? Happens in a backyard. Those stories are brought together by a chair, right? Who did what to a chair, right? Which should make you ask, what is a tort? What do you think a tort is? What is the meaning of a tort, do you think? Given that you did very well, good, good, good. You understand the facts of the case as well. Um, what do you think a tort is? Why does tort law care about this? I think one of the element of torts is that one gets a kind of injured and it is not serious enough to be a crime. Okay, so, so there is a distinction between tort and criminal law, certainly is. There's also a distinction between tort law and contract law, other forms of civil law. But what exactly does Ruth Garrett say happened to her? She says the chair was moved, but is she saying someone did something wrong to her? Is she saying that someone... What is she saying? Um, there is a wrongful act of Brian Correct. Yeah, to pull out the chair. Good, good, good. So remember, that is why you're reading this in tort. Tort is about civil wrongs. It's when someone does something wrong to someone else, like the simple act of moving a chair when someone is trying to sit down. That is a tort because it is an unpermitted act under American tort law, right? So who sued whom? Ruth, Ga Ruth Garrett sued Brian Daly in the 1950s in the state of Washington. Why? Because she alleges that as she was about to sit down, Brian Daly, knowing that she was about to sit down, acted with purpose. He moved that chair. She fractured her hip, gets injured, and she sues. And what is she asking for, Gloria? Do you remember what she's asking for? Yes, I remember she asked for a compensation of $11,000. So she sues for compensation, right? So keep this in mind when you're thinking about tort law. Why is it that an adult would sue a child, a child, five years old and nine months? Shouldn't we allow our children to be children? Think of this word compensation, payment when someone injures someone else. We will come back to that. You've done very well. You, like Rosa, should be very proud of yourself. We do hope you send in your application. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's say hello to someone online. Eddie, how are you, Eddie? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, of course. Well, I'm so glad. How are you doing? Um, 
Very well. So in this case, let's move on to the next question. What happened in the lower courts? Now, this might seem boring, especially if you haven't, if you haven't been to law school. You say to yourself, why should I care what happened in the lower courts? Just tell me who wins. Is it going to be Ruth or Brian? Just tell me who wins this case and tell me why they win. Eddie, do you know why we care about what happened in the lower courts? Why do we, why do they put this question there? Why should we care? Can you, can you guess what, why do we care about this question? What happened in the lower courts? So in the lower court, the judge just uh, accept only the testimony from the defendant, not to the sister of the plaintiff. Good, good, good. Who is the defendant? The defendant is the little boy, Brian. So why do we care about this? To care about uh, what? Why do we ask? So I asked this question, so you gave me a really good answer, right? Yeah. In the lower court, the lower court believes the young boy, right? Believes the boy who's five years old and nine months. But why do we ask this question? Why do we say, what did the lower court do? And um, so probably the claimant or the plaintiff has the has a question or suspicion why the lower court just accepts the plaintiff's testimony instead of her, her sister's. Okay, so you care about this question for the following reason, and that's right, that sounds right. In the American legal system, right, you, probably, you may know we have three, generally we have three levels of court. When you sue someone, you don't immediately go to the state's highest court. You go to the lowest court first, the trial court. Those of you who've studied law before probably know this already, right? But not everyone does. So you go to the trial court. So you, in this case, Ruth Garrett would have had to go to the trial court, the first court, and said, give me money because a boy who is five years old and nine months injured me. The trial court gives its decision, right? The trial court is the one that gathers all the facts, right? It's, that's where the fact-finding, at that level, that's where the fact-finding happens. Not the judges who get the facts, it's the lawyers who bring the facts to the court. The trial court listens to that testimony, sometimes with a jury. Eddie, do you know if there was a jury in this case? I haven't noticed that. Good, 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 because there was none. The judge decided this case, right? The judge can decide certain cases. Um, so the judge here heard the testimony in the lower court, and the judge said, I believe, right, the boy. Why? Why did the, Eddie, why did the judge believe the boy? Why did the judge believe Brian Daly? Do you remember? Because uh, as a little boy, he the judge believed that probably most of the evidence showed that he has no knowledge of doing that kind of intention or has no intention of doing that kind of crime or action. Right. So a little clarification, we're not dealing with crimes here, yeah. right? We're dealing with civil wrongs, which is different. If it's a crime, it's the state that is going to sue. The government will use a prosecutor to bring, generally bring the lawsuit. So here, the trial court believes the boy because it says he didn't have intent. He didn't intend to harm the adult. And then the question that arises for us as lawyers is, what does the word intent mean? If I intend to do something in the law, what does that mean? What do I want to do? And how can I intend to do something under American law? Thank you, Eddie. Let's move on to someone in the classroom. Good, good, good. We hope to receive your application. Let us also say hello to, is it Diana? Hi. So why does, how are you doing? Why? I was inspired by your opening I'm glad. I hope you're inspired by the rest of the presentation. Yeah, it's I will. <laughs> so why did the judge find, the trial court judge, find that Brian Daly does not have intent? 
I think it's probably because he is young, only five years old and nine months. So uh, the judge think that he does not have the capability to um, have any intentions uh, to let somebody down on the floor, uh, down on the floor or the, or the ground. So that's a possibility, but based on what we have in the case, we have the judge just saying he didn't have any purpose. Willful or unlawful intention. Good. He didn't have... What does that mean? Um, I think that probably means that he does not have the predictability of uh, the uncertainty of uh, Garrett Wilfell on the floor. He doesn't have the certainty. So what does purpose mean for you when you hear the word my purpose is to do something, right? If I say my purpose is to do something, what exactly does that mean? Um, so technically, it, it means my desire to do something. But according to the law term, I think that's um, the willing of substantial uh, cert uncertainty. Well, slightly different. Your first answer is correct, right? Purpose means you desire that something happens. So the trial court here, when it looked at these facts, said Brian Daly did not desire to bring up, uh, about an unlawful contact with his aunt, right? He did not act with purpose to injure her. So why then do we have someone appealing? And who is appealing in this case? Uh, uh, absolutely, Ruth Garrett is appealing for uh, the firstly is that uh, the compensation number is very high, which uh, account for eleven thousand dollar, and then uh, also Naomi think that um, I think that would be Daly has the intention to uh, predict that Garrett will be falling on the floor. So you got the following correct. Garrett is the one who appeals. She is unhappy when the judge says the boy lacked the purpose. Why? Because she's been injured, right? Someone has to pay those bills. $11,000 in 1950 is worth almost $101,000 US dollars today. So $11,000 US dollars is an still a lot of money, but adjusted for inflation, this is an incredible amount of money that she's asking for. She had to have been severely injured, right? To be asking for almost, at least in today's money, more than $100,000. So she appeals. She appeals and she says, the trial court got this wrong. That the boy should not have won this case. Right? I should have won this case. The answer to that, thank you very much. We look forward to receiving your application. Um, let's move on now. Is it Richie? How are you? I'm better than before. I'm so glad that you're better than before. So we will wait for you to receive the microphone. It would be an interesting tool, and it's true. Yes, it is. I mean, yes, it is an interesting tool. It creates torts. It can create torts. So in this case, what does Garrett say when she appeals? Right? She's unhappy that she lost. But when you appeal your case, you must ask questions of the judges in the upper courts. What are the questions here that she asks the court? Um, so, professor, professor, you mean uh, the plaintiff's questions? Yes. So she loses, right? Yeah. She loses. Um, and so she loses, and then she appeals. She says, I don't like this decision. I would like another result. The boy hurt me. He has to pay me money, right? And so this case goes up to the Supreme Court, right? The Supreme Court of Washington. And... Normally, when a case goes up, you ask the court questions, specific questions. Do you think she asks specific questions here of the Supreme Court? Um, well, I see, in fact, in this case, uh, there are two versions of facts. In the plaintiff's version of facts, uh, the plaintiff obviously thought uh, the defendant ha um, had intention, but uh, the trial court adopted the, uh, the second version of the fact, so I think the plaintiff may be unpleasant with the outcome, so she sued. So she sues, and you mentioned the word, the intent, right? The question here is about the nature of intent that you need to commit a tort. So intent, we learned, has one possible meaning, right? Purpose. 
When you intend to do something, we say you acted with purpose to do something. And the trial court only focused on... And I think the trial court only focused on the first type of intention. Uh, in fact, intention has, has two types. And the other intention means uh, when you do something you knew with substantial certainty that um, this um, harmful or offensive con contact would happen. So I think the trial court neglect uh, the second type. Good, good, good. So the trial court focuses on whether the young boy acted with purpose, whether he had a desire to bring about a harmful or offensive contact. And it says no. He did not have any desire to bring about a harmful or offensive contact. Do you think uh, Brian Daly was trying to play a joke on his aunt? Well, well I think it's hard, hard to say. Um, but from my own opinion, I think maybe Brian Daly just wanted to um, play a joke with, with the old lady, but something bad, bad happened. Yeah. So we get this from a part of the opinion, right? We don't know if she's old. Uh, we do know that she's an adult, right? Um, and even if she were older, that wouldn't really be the issue, right? So we do know there's a part of opinion that the court says he did not intend to play a prank, a joke, yeah. right? The trial court finds that this was, uh, his purpose was not to harm her by, by doing a joke. So he didn't have any purpose to hurt the adult. So no joke. But what about if I change the facts a little bit? If I told you that Brian Daly at his school had seen other boys and girls play the following game, right? One girl is about to sit down and the other girl or boy pulls the chair away. Or a boy is about to sit down and another girl or boy pulls the chair away. And then the girl or the boy falls to the ground. If I had told you that Brian Daly had seen this game at school, which not in this case, but in a related case, we find out, and I think it's in this case, not in the version that you got, but there's evidence that he may have seen people play this game at school. Would this change your view of the facts in this case, that he saw people playing this game at school? Uh, well, it's true. Uh, well, I think uh, we need to define facts uh, under different circumstances. In the scenario of campus, I think it's common for students to play such games. One student's wrong and, and the other maybe pull the chair out from, uh, out from the student. I think if in the scenario of campus life, I think um, it's natural for us to reach the conclusion that he wanna, play it, he, he wanna play a joke with the student. So if you knew that he played this game at school with other students, would that make you think that he wanted to play the same game with his aunt? Oh, well, and I think, yeah. And if you, so we're changing the facts, right? And if you thought that he wanted to play exactly the same game with his aunt, do you think that he acted with purpose if he wanted to just play the same game with his aunt? Well, I think if I played the game with my aunt, as I need to respect my relatives, I don't think it, it's, it's a... It's a joke. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. So you think it's purpose? Mm. Yeah, I think he's on purpose. Right. So remember that. Even if he says, right, when you're thinking of intent, if he says it was just a joke, right, it was just a joke, we can still find that he, we, he had the necessary purpose or intent to touch someone in a way that is not allowed under the law, right? So this is what we have. We'll, we'll talk about whether or not we should sue children in a little bit. So we've got the facts of the case. We've got what happened in the lower courts. We've got our first question. Do you only need to show purpose or must you show something else? And Richie correctly says, something called substantial certainty. So purpose, does, is there another way you can show purpose? Oh, sorry, is there another way you can show intent, right? Purpose is number one. Is there something else you can use to make the boy liable and pay money? So that's the issue in this case. Do you only need purpose 
or do you need something else? Now, you may be asking, why should I care about this question? Why? Who cares about intent? Who cares about purpose? Here is why we care about intent in the law. Because intent tells us about the level of fault. What is the level of wrongfulness that you had in mind, or we believe that you had in mind when you injured someone else? Intent in American torts is the highest level of fault, right? Because you acted with purpose. It was your desire to harm someone else, to bring about a harmful or offensive contact. This is why we care about intent. It is the highest level, right? And so to understand the meaning of that intent, we have to ask, what does it involve? How do you show intent under American law? You do it, one, by showing that someone acted with purpose. And here you're seeing that we can say a child can or cannot act with purpose, right? A child can or cannot desire to touch someone else in a way that is not permitted under the law. And we also care about this, this issue, because if you learn that this is the question in this case, you also learn why we are reading the case. And why does that matter? Because that is probably the most important skill, or one of the most important skills you will have as a lawyer, is to read a case and say to yourself, this is the legal issue here. This is the question the court has to answer. Why do we care about that in American law? Because the answer to that question is the law, right? In American law, you don't receive a sheet of paper with, well, there are statutes that says, this is the law, this is the law, this is the law, this is the law. You have to read opinions. So the skill that we're teaching you is, how do you read these opinions? How do you take out the most important things? And how do you say, this is the law? Right? So you're reading the law about intent. How can you intend, or in what ways can you intend to cause a contact? That's why that question matters. What are the questions in this case? That is, what is about to become the law? Right? Good, good, good. We look forward to receiving your application. Good, good, good. Uh, let's move on. Thank you, Richie. Let's move on now to... Uh, Lee, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Really? No. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me why. Because it's my turn now, so I got a little bit nervous. I can imagine. You know, when I was at law school, and I tell this to our wonderful 1L students, when I was at law school, I hated being on call. Um, I remember once running out of the classroom when I thought the professor was going to call on me. Uh, because my stomach started rumbling. I was just so uncomfortable and so scared and so intimidated. And I didn't like hearing, Mr. Rudolph, say, okay, time for me to leave the classroom. Um, and then you realize what the professor is doing. The professor is not there to scare you. Okay. Not at all. You're just here to ask a few questions about the case, okay. about people's lives, how the law dealt with it. What did you think of this case? Uh, think of this case? Yeah. What is your opinion of this case? Well, one part I found particularly interesting for me is that um, the court, the high, high, higher court, uh, determined that um, a battery would be established if the, pl uh, if the uh, defendant had substantial certainty that an offensive conduct or apprehension would occur. Uh, I kind of liked that uh, distinction. Between Why did you them. like that? Well, because it provided a different insight. Well, the lower court only focused on, as you said, the first, um, the first level of intent. But if we could prov prove that the defendant had substantial certainty that the offensive contact would occur, then we're, we would have reason to believe that he kind of acted with his uh, intent. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. What we've just received from Lee is actually the law that comes out of this case. That is the legal answer that comes out of this case. Why? So the question here was, do you, can you only show purpose? Do you only need purpose to show intent to cause a tort? And the answer to that, as we've just heard, is no. Right? It's not only purpose. 
It's either purpose or substantial certainty, right? If Garrett, if, if Brian Daly, uh, with knowledge to a substantial degree of certainty below purpose, knew that Ruth Garrett was about to sit down, he was substantially certain that she was about to sit down when he pulled that chair, he had intent, right? So you're seeing that this case is teaching you two ways of dealing with this question of intent. You can intend to do something when it's your purpose to do that thing, or when you are substantially certain that the consequences or the results are about to follow. Good, good, good. You have just stated the holding of the case. The holding of the case means the law. What is the legal result of the case? Now, those of you who've read, I'm sure many of you have read this very, very closely. So that's the big question here. Is, it, oh, is intent only about purpose or is it something else? But there are other questions that are not really about tort law, right? There are other issues here that are not really about tort law. They're about other wonderful classes that we teach here at the law school. Um, as our dean said, we teach not only in the common law curriculum, the international curriculum, but we also have a wonderful and fantastic Chinese legal program here. Um, do apply to our wonderful law school. We'd love to have your application. Um, so another class you will learn here is civil procedure, right? And so here there are procedural questions. Those procedural questions, does anyone pick up a, what they believe is a procedural question? It's not about tort law, it's about what a court can do. So one procedural question here is, for example, um, Garrett lost the case in the lower court. He wants a new trial, right? He wants the top courts to order a new trial for her. The question is, does she get a new trial, right? We've got the tort question, what does intent mean? But there's the related question, which is not tort law, it's procedural law, will she get a new trial, right? So just keep that in mind, that's for civil procedure. Different class, but you should know this question is in there, right? And there's another procedural question that comes up here. Should she have gotten a verdict from the court, a directed verdict for $11,000? She wants the $11,000, right? So that's like a remedies procedural question. That we set aside for a little later. We are just going to focus on the court law questions, right? So as you're seeing, when you read a case, there are lots of legal issues. Your job, we will teach you how to do this, is to pick up those legal issues, right? How are they? What are the questions? How are they answered? So thank you very much to uh, those who participated so far in class. Let's move online. Is Leon here from online? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Professor? Yes, we can hear you very, very clearly. How are you, Leon? I'm good, I guess. What did you think of this case? Um, I I think this case is 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 uh, pretty complicated. I, I I guess I I think it's very simple because I think in the in the Supreme Court uh, they give a different definition for 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 intent, and I kind of uh, interested in the, the the second definition because uh, you know, no no matter what. Uh, in, no matter what uh, circumstances that we believe that they intend to 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 do something, so that there's intent. So we kind of, uh, if the defendant, if the plaintiff can't prove that uh, the the child, the plaintiff, have intent, so we find some external facts to prove that. So the Supreme Court finds some external facts, so they. They, they, uh, so they find the the, the uh, second definition of intent. So I think it's pretty complicated for me for the first time. Oh, good, good, good. It sounds like you have understood what's going on in this case as well, right? 
the question here has to deal with intent, and it's a complicated case because it raises really difficult questions about how do you define intent? Can a child have intent, right? At what age can you have intent? How can you use a child's knowledge in a case to define intent, right? These are the legal questions that matter in this case. Leon, when you were reading this case, did you pick up any rules that the court applies, right? When oh, the court yeah. is answering the legal questions, it must use rules, laws. What rules does it use to answer these questions about intent? Well, just Did you pick up any uh, rules that it uses. Just uh, in my opinion, just uh, this uh, this writing uh, uh, it used five uh, five rules. The, the first one is. Uh, Anyone can be sued if they do something wrong. Even innocent let's, let's pause is there. liable for, for the wrongful let's act. Let's pause there. Good, 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 right? Anyone can be sued in American tort law, can be held liable for a tort, even a child. That is a rule. Where does that rule come? It's on... Um, your case, your, the, the case that we sent you says there is case law, there are treatises, which means there are treatments of the law that tell you that even when a child has committed a tort, that child can be sued. Right? So that is the legal rule that is being applied here. So keep that in mind, right? And why do we care about this? Because the court can't just say a child can be sued. It must find a legal rule from previous opinions or from somewhere else that allow it to say a child can be sued. So that's rule number one. A child can be sued. Okay? So you can tell the way this case is going to go. A child can be sued. Rule number two. There is an even bigger rule here. Did you pick that up, Leon? Uh, yes, because uh, the plaintiff urged that she she wants a uh, reach out and uh, and she 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 wanted uh, to define the defendant's action to a battery. So the second rule is what is a battery to define the battery? I guess. Okay. So this case, is not, you're not you're reading this case for about the meaning uh, for the meaning of intent. But in total, sorry. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay between so, both of us speaking. Can you repeat what you said? I didn't hear you. Uh, because uh, what, cons what constitutes battery uh, concludes intent. So I, I, I guess that the judge used uh, the, de the definition of battery to, to, to give the floor to uh, what is intention, to, to, to show us what is intention. So what constitutes the battery okay. is intent good so battery requires intent so what is a battery yes. a, a bet just hold on a battery is when you intend to cause a harmful or offensive contact with someone else right you must intend a harmful or offensive contact with someone else to prove that there is a battery in this case we have to prove that garrett that brian daly had either purpose or he was substantially certain that a harmful or offensive contact with the adult would happen. Uh, thank you, Leon. Let's move on to someone else. Uh, Emma, who's online, good afternoon. Yes, yes, I'm online. How are you, Emma? I'm fine. <laughs> Did you pick up any other rules that are applied in this case? Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, from from the third page from the material you sent me, there mm -hmm. is there is the restatement says uh, character of actor's intention. I believe it's it's uh, a rule to to further explain uh, the definition of. A battery. Good. Right. 
So thank you so much to Leon. We hope to receive your application as well. Um, so Emma has just told us that there's something called the restatement, right? We really care about the restatement in tort law. Why do we re care about this, this document called the restatement? Because it's a summary of legal principles. It's written by judges, lawyers, and professors. The restatement on its own is not the law. It is not the law. The restatement has to be used by a court, adopted by a court before it becomes the law. So here, the court is citing to this document. And it says, this document tells us that for a battery, you need intent. But you not only need purpose, you also need substantial certainty, right? So were you convinced by the court's reasoning in this opinion, Emma? Yeah. Why? It, uh, I looked from the Mercurial, it says that it is not enough that the act itself is intentionally done, and this, I believe that the court is uh, reasoning, its, uh, reasoning its way to its conclusion by uh, further uh, explaining the, the distinction between an intent uh, and non-intent. So here the court, good, good, good. So here the court tells you, so why do we care about this? This is the legal reasoning. This is the part that gets really interesting. How does the court use the legal rule in the case? We got a legal rule that says you can sue a child for uh, a tort. You got another legal rule that says, well, you must not only show not only purpose is enough, you could also use substantial certainty. The next question becomes, how does the court use these things to justify itself? So the court here tells us that there is no consent, right? It tells us that uh, Ruth Garrett did not agree to have the boy play a prank on her. He did not agree to have the chair pulled away from her, right? Because if she had agreed, she would lose the lawsuit. She gave him permission, right? So she didn't give him permission. So now we've got to find out about this intent. So the trial court, we're told, says, well, he didn't act with purpose. But something's missing, the court tells us, because now we've got this rule, right? So the substantial certainty part of this prompt. What do you think substantial certainty means? Um, I mean, uh, substantial certainty is something, um, it's like, uh, you should not only uh, has a desire to do something, but also you think you can manage to make it. It's so, like uh, it's some fact that you are so sure that it will happen. So it seems to me that you're mixing two things, right? You're right to point to the importance of substantial certainty. But you said substantial certainty, if I heard you correctly, involves desire. Remember that desire is very different from substantial certainty. Des desire means purpose, right? Substantial certainty is something less than purpose, right? So purpose, substantial certainty. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we will now move on to someone. We hope to receive your application. We'll mo now move on to, forgive me, there's no Sheng Diao here. So is it Jia Bo? Yeah. How are you? What did you think of this case? Um, to me, it's quite interesting because I was a pretty uh, naughty boy when I was at the age of five. Did and you throw people's chairs away? Yeah, surely. I'll do like much worse than that. And I could have substantial certainty. In. So uh, I believe that the, the judges who decide that the children is innocent should be a very kind person that can't imagine a boy can be so bad, but if I were the judge, I would believe so because I was bad. Um, so you, do you believe that judges should rely on their own experience? If the law says one thing and the judge's experience says something else, what should the judge do? I think in the common law, the uh, jury, no, no, the judges, like, how do you call it, judicial activism is allowed in the course of common law. So, 
and also in common law. The, what do you mean by judicial activism? It's like the judges can, in terms of explain how the law should be used and explain as a cause of creating the law to enhance the meaning of law and guide the followers how to use this law oh, in certain... Enough. So if you yeah. mean that they can develop the law, this sounds right. Uh, but judicial activism also has this almost negative sound to it, right? That judges knowing the law says one thing, but forcing it or pushing it purposefully in a different direction. Do you think the court um, got the decision right in this case? I, I think so, because like, uh, yeah, you don't have the sufficient amount to a su uh, sufficient amount of evidence to prove that the child is uh, doing things with certain level of uh, how do you call it? Yeah, I, a substantial certainty of the results and its behavior. And, and for this term, I I think. How sufficient is enough is that the boy understand his action and the probable harm that would cause to the people that he is doing so and the logical relation between his action and the harmness that's going to impose on the person that suffer. Um, in this okay, case, let's, we, yeah. let's pause there because you said some two really interesting things. You said that he should understand the, the action. Yes. He should understand the probability um, of harm. Yeah. And that, does that tell you about purpose or about substantial certainty? Uh, substantial certainty. Yeah, right? Substantial certainty does not mean actual certainty. It probably means highly probable, yeah. right? He should understand that it is highly probable that harm will result. And then you said the logical relationship between what he does and the injury meaning causation, yeah. right? Do you think that we should be suing children? Uh, I think it, we, we can, but we should be really cautious about suing uh, children. Because chil uh, there could be very bad children. Like, as I said, there could be very bad children. And also, like, children develop and children grow. And at this period of time of his life, it might be very bad. But there is a great deal of chance that he can otherwise be a good man or a good woman in the rest of his life or her life. Um, so in terms of suing children, you should really take into consideration of that we should not rip off his or her possibility to be a good man or a good woman in the rest of his life just because he did something wrong at the very young age of his life. At what age um, does one become a child? At what age does one stop being a child? Uh, in China, I believe, in terms of criminal law, the age would be 16. And you become a child at 16? No, no, no. To take responsibility for the action that you take that is against the law, so would be 16. At 16? The fully. So I need to defer to my colleagues here who are experts on Chinese law. I cannot speak about Chinese law. But since you've read, about, since you've read this case, at what age do you think a child under American law becomes a child and stops being a child? You read a case. You told me that you agree with the result in the case, which means, from what you've told me, you do agree that someone who is five years, nine months is a child. So we know that in your definition of what is a child, five years, nine months equals a child. But at what age do you start being a child? And at what age do you stop being a child? And this would matter legally because from what you've told us, you don't want to damage someone's life later with a legal decision that's bad. Uh, for me, I think you should not have a like uh, one standard for all circumstances. Just to be specific, in this case, if you want to define whether or not this uh, Brian is children enough to be taken softly, is that um, He's just at the age of five, and I don't think he really understands how his action can result in serious fracture of heap and other damage. I don't think a five years old boy understands what fracture is. I certainly did not understand what a fracture is. So you've changed your opinion a little bit, because you told us earlier, you said at that age, and I don't want to speak about your personal life, yeah. but you told us at that age, you were pretty aware of what you were doing. Um, and then, but you're, now you're saying, it's fair, it's, that's okay, that happens. You're saying, but 
I don't think he understands the nature of the injury. Do you think we should require him to understand the nature of the injury? Or should we require him to understand, do not touch other people's bodies without their permission? Uh, oh, I just make a clarification. I think the boy at age of five years old understand it's bad to pull somebody else's chair away when they are sitting down. But I don't think it's fair for we to take the assumption that a five years old can understand that this action will result in fracture of hip. Okay. So, he understands the nature of the action, but he doesn't necessarily understand the result of the action. Fair enough. He doesn't, uh, so it sounds like he understands the result of the action of pulling, well, the legal result, right? So we must distinguish between the intent, right? Purpose, substantial certainty, right? So in everyday life, moving a chair, like if I move this chair, this is not a tort, assuming it's my chair or I'm allowed to touch this chair, otherwise it is a tort right? Moving a chair in everyday life is not a tort. The tort happens when so what am I saying there? I'm saying that in tort law, sure, there is an injury. Sometimes there is no physical injury. But we care about certain things. Miss Garrett has a body. Right? We all have bodies. She has a right to that body being safe. That body being able to sit down. It doesn't sound like much, right? We think, oh, why should I care about a chair? But $11,000 in damages. Almost $101,000 today. Right? And not only that, it's not about the money. It's about how does this broken hip change her life? Think of that. How does a broken hip change her life? What does it do to her? Right? And so I understand, right, my job as your, I'm not yet your teacher, but as maybe one day or someone who will work with you is to push you and ask you, what do you mean when you say he doesn't understand? Sure, he may not understand the injury, but should we care about the fact that he doesn't understand the injury or should we care about the fact that he touched a woman in a way that he is not allowed to touch her. You tell me. And you can say, where is the touch? But we'll come to that. Uh, what should we care about? That he doesn't know, sure, five years old, nine months. When I was five years old, nine months, I'm sure my parents would say, ah, uh, difficult child. But you break, well, you do something Think of it. A woman, a man, it doesn't matter. An, an individual ends up on the ground. Crack. That leg. Now, we don't know what happened to that leg, but we know she suffered. So what should we care about in the law? So you're asking, like, which of these two is more important yes, to the law? Tell me. Tell me. The injury or the fact that he did something that he's not supposed to do? Or should we say he's allowed to move the chair even when someone is about to sit down? And if we say that, what does that mean? She gets no money. She shatters the hip, goes to the hospital, and pays the bill herself. Oh, I think it's a very tough question. Uh, Try. You're doing well. I know this. Okay, so what is important to the law? What's the purpose of law? Why do we have law? We have law is not to punish people because we can otherwise punish people harder without law. What do you mean? Uh, back in the age of medieval time, we don't have law, but we have pretty tough punishment. And punishment doesn't justify the world. Like, okay, the, the lady here suffered a fracture of heat and that's going to change her life. But punishment on this boy doesn't change the fact that she suffered. Okay. And okay. like without sufficient amount of evidence, okay. punishment imposed on this boy okay. not only can't help the lady, well, yes. well ex except for monetary term, yes. it also means a great deal to a boy that just at the age of just starting to understand, to get a of the world 
this bitter taste oh, that okay. he might understand. That he did. Sorry, you're raising your hand. Please, tell us what you think. Oh, okay. And tell us your name, please, so that we yeah, remember. Yeah, my name is Dong Wenying. Uh, Wenying. Dong. Dong. Uh, you can Dong. Call, call me Dong. Dong. Oh, really nice uh, to meet you. Yeah. Uh, I want tell share, them what you think. Yeah, I want to share my opinion about, um, I think, why we have laws it to uh, make people uh, can expect a safe and uh, a safe and order life. And uh, um, the, the example, the case, make an example to the parents. Uh, you need to teach your child and not to do something to hurt people. Uh, maybe you doesn't have the intent of harm, harm, but you need to pay attention to this part. But the other yeah. they just say to you, shouldn't yeah. we allow children to be children? Sure, we should say to yeah. parents, Watch over your child, supervise your child. Your child should not hurt other people. But shouldn't we allow children to be... Ch now, what, what your colleague here would say is, you are talking about Miss Garrett. There is a boy who was taken to court. Can you imagine telling a child who is five years old and nine months, you're going to court? What? <laughs> Darling, you're going to court. Yeah. What does that mean? You are being sued. Uh, what does that mean? That means I have to take you um, and they're going to ask you some questions. That's what your colleague is saying. Not only what does it mean for the plaintiff, what about the defendant here who is five years old and nine months? Shouldn't the law care about that? Right? This is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, ch uh, children can be a, a part of the, the court. Children can be called, be called. But why? That's, so I understand that you're saying that mm -hmm. we should be able to sue children, but is it the right thing for us to do, to sue children? I think uh, compared to a, a big benefit to the society, social, um, the children can take the, the ability. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We hope to receive your application. Lee? Oh, sorry. Um, thank you both. Okay. Um, this is a very interesting discussion, so I wanted to share my opinions. Oh, sure. uh, well, for, for, for the male there, um, <laughs> the male classmate there. Uh, your colleague. Um, yeah, my colleague there. I just, because uh, I was really intrigued by his saying, like, uh, I can see that you have mercy for the kid, but why can't you just have mercy for the lady? Like, and like, because you're saying that how this decision, the punishment will affect the children, but this injury has also done a lot of harm to the lady. And like, because of others, um, reckless or intentional act, which I think it's unfair because you only consider for the kid. And also as for the age of, I think um, in this case, the, uh, regardless of the age of the kid, uh, the decision is, determined regardless of the age of the kid. Uh, but I think age will be considered only when uh, the age can in fact uh, affect his cognitive capabilities. Because for example, if a child, uh, for example, his parents are lawyers, maybe he knew about the court. So when you tell him you're going to court, maybe he, he would know, but for other kids, they may not know. So if they're the same age, but the child A, he has this knowledge of what his actions, but for the child B of the same age, he may not know the action, uh, the consequences of his actions. So I think uh, here age is not the issue, but his uh, cognitive capabilities is the issue. If to, to know if he really uh, knows what he is doing. Okay, so you're saying his cognitive abilities. Do you think so? Here is an argument that a professor has made. Do you think that we should take children to the hospital and have them get brain scans to see how developed their brains are? And if the child has a developed, the child's brain is developing nicely, um, we assume that this child has superior cognitive abilities and can go to trial. Should we do this to children? Do you understand? Some say, yeah, go to the hospital, get brain scans of the child, 
If the child is brain is sufficiently developed, Sue. Do you think we should do this? Uh, I think it's not just physical. Uh, maybe I used the wrong term cognitive capability. I mean, it also like, because Brian gave his testimony and he said how he thought uh, of his actions. So he gave his reasoning. So maybe different children, they will give different reasoning. Some children may give reasoning that can show that he has certain purposes or intent. But um, as for the brain scan, I think if we are judging cases about kids that, or adults that have certain uh, cognitive inabilities, maybe we can do that test if that test does not do any harm to that person. So it sounds like you want one rule that applies to all children. One rule? You want the same rule that applies to all children. Mm, what rule? Um, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that there's some children, right, who yeah. are, grew up in households in which they may understand what a court process is, they may be more developed. In some cases, mm -hmm. some children are not as exposed to legal cultures and legal norms. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, if I understand you correctly, we shouldn't distinguish between them, we should treat them the same. We should have one rule that applies to all of them. Is that what you're saying? Actually, I'm not really clear if you're saying what I'm saying. So tell me what you're saying so I understand if I've um, But I think the criteria is the same. Like, yes. um, yeah, the criteria is the yes. same. So you want one rule that, yes. Yeah. You want one rule that applies to everyone else. So let's ask someone online what they think. Thank you both. Uh, Fred, hi, you're online. Fred, are you with us? Oh, Fred is in the classroom. I apologize. Fred is in the classroom. Fred, I apologize. I thought you were, I thought you were online. What do you think? Do you think we should be suing children? Uh, I think, yes. Uh, Brian actually did this, and we should, we should sue Brian, but uh, I think... I think the final liability would come to his parents. <laughs> yes. That's Why do you say that? Uh, like I say, if, if we think that Brian should be responsible for this, but how can he pay the money? Right. Or how, uh, how can he help recover the fracture? That is correct. Yeah. Right. So a different issue, you must first answer the liability issue. That is the legal issue is, did he act with intent? Did he cause a battery here? And then after you ask that question and you get your answer, you say, should he pay money? Right? And then the question becomes, where do we get that money from? He is five years old and nine months. Where are we going to get that money from? And you're right. It's usually from the parents. There's usually some sort of insurance. Not always. And so you sue because you want the insurance money. Um, and that's what's going to pay for the lawsuit. Right? So you're speaking about the goals of the law. Um, just hold on, I'll come back to you. You're speaking about the goals of the law, right? Remember that in American law for torts, one of the goals is deterrence. You want to stop people from doing these kinds of things, right? So you can see that the result in this case, does it have to do with deterrence, Fred? What? Does the result in this case have to do with deterrence, preventing people from moving chairs when people are about to sit down? No. No? Why not? Uh... If the court says not only purpose, but also substantial certainty, isn't this about stopping people from committing these types of torts by saying there are two ways you can show them? Uh, I think actually Brian doesn't know the results. He doesn't uh, try to harm, uh, harm the lady on purpose. Right, so there's yeah. no purpose here. Yes. But we have to look at substantial certainty, yes. right? Why? Because we want to stop people from doing these kinds of things. So one of the goals of tort law is to stop people from doing these kinds of things. Another goal of tort law is compensation, is to pay people when they're harmed. Another goal of tort law, what, what do you think another goal of tort law might be, Fred? Like, uh, if, so, so in this case, if Brian is finally should be responsible for, uh, for this fracture, I think, so that Brian should pay for the money and or she should try to figure some way to like uh for rough recovery 
I think that's the compensation. So that's compensation. Yeah. Can anyone think of another goal of tort law? Let me go online. Lisa, who's online, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you, Lisa? Lisa, can you hear me? Yes. What do you think a goal of tort law is? My opinion on the tort the goals law. Goals or objectives of tort the law. Goal. The yeah, goal. Yeah, what should the objectives of tort law be? One of your colleagues says we should not be thinking of punishment. There should be no punishment in tort law. Do you agree? Well, I think the tort law is an, actually is an interaction between two sides, the man who made the harm to another one. So I think that it is a um, process that we can um, a part um, just uh, protect ourselves from being hurt, and it can be a notice that you should pay attention to your actions, whether it will do harm to others, so that it maybe it will bring you some responsibility to burden. Um, okay, so there's a yeah. sense of justice in tort law, and think of why um, Ruth Garrett sued. She sued, she wanted money. But what else could she have done in this case? As soon as Brian Daly, if this is true, right, that Brian Daly pulled the chair when she was about to sit down, in some places she would have done a terrible thing. She would have hit the child, right? Tort law is one way of preventing physical violence. Instead of responding to an injury with violence, you sue, right? Because if she had struck the child, assume that. Now, he pulls the chair, and then she does a terrible thing. She hits the child. What can the child now do to her? He can, he can sue her for battery, right? This is a battery, but touching him in this way is also a battery. She might say uh, self-defense or whatever, but tort law is a way of preventing this kind of thing so that she doesn't hit him. She says, I'm injured, I'm going to court. Okay? So another, that's justice, right? And American tort law, another goal uh, that is said is actually punishment. Right? It is punishment. We may not agree with it, but it is one of the goals that is recited for American tort law, is punishment. Right? You can get punishment damages. You can get money to punish someone so that they don't do this again. You can get money, like you go to the hospital, right? Your hospital bill comes. You will get money for your hospital bill. And then you could also ask for punishment money. Right? so that people don't do this type of thing again. You can ask for that. So we don't know here if she got punitive damages, punishment money, but she may have asked for them. Okay? So you've read, uh, you had a question. Sorry, I saw your hand go up. Just felt the answer that I just gave was, wasn't comprehensive and that ignited a lot of discussion. So, uh, so after some thought, I, I think I will have three main points mm -hmm. in because we were just been discussing quite touching like what the law should be, what the law can be, mm -hmm. and what the law should do. So mm -hmm. like the first point, I think the, peop uh, the dis discussion that we are having just now, like lots of people have an underlying assumption that sue means guilt. Someone sue, someone is sued means yeah. someone is guilt. But so we kind of discuss like should this, ch ch uh, should this child be sued, should children be sued? But uh, I realized that like, sue is not only to accuse someone of being guilty, it's also to prevent innocent people being falsely accused. As I said, like uh, without law, we can punish people even harshly, but we need law to prevent innocent people being punished. 
regardless of harshly or softly. Um, that's why we have this lawsuit. We have this uh, we have this case, and the result is that there is isn't sufficient evidence to uh, link to uh, the action to that sufficient <laughs> level of to be accused of guilty. And then the second question on, now I think is like what the law can do, because what my colleague just appointed that okay, if we prevent this kid being punished and that left a bad mark to the rest of his life, then what the law can do for the lady that suffered from this action. So that question is quite interesting because like people tend to think that law can cover all the issues around lives and law can fix all the wrongs, justify things, but can the law really do that much? And do that underlying assumption is if we have a good law and that we conduct it fully, then there isn't going to be any problem with the world, but the world isn't like that. So it's, uh, I think it's like the law should do the part law can do and leave the hours to, for example, the social security network or the uh, uh, social welfare. Maybe the lady could be taken care of by other methods. That is not what to do. I'm oh, sorry, we're, we're actually, I, I, sorry, sorry to cut you. We've only got one minute left. And okay. So the last thing I, I want to say is that what the law is and what the law should be. And I think the law should be kind for a better world to create where a little child should be given a chance. Yes, I think your, your point is fairly consistent, right? You, you are very uncomfortable with the child um, having his future taken away from him. So we have about a minute left. Um, this is the case that you've read. You've read a case involving two adults and a child right? One adult gets injured. She sues, she says, uh, she sues and she says, you battered me. You touched me in a legally uh, impermissible manner. The child says, well, I didn't touch you, right? I was just trying to move the chair and you sat down before, right? It was not intentional. I did not intend. The court here does not really resolve that issue. It just says, go and find out if he was substantially certain. A year later, we have the following opinion. Brian Daly is found liable for battery. Why? Because the court holds that he is substantially certain when, he, when she's about to sit down um, that he is uh, engaging in a battery. Right? So he's found liable. The court says he has the intent and he's done something illegal and he has to pay $11,000 in damages. So that happens in the following case. We are truly, truly delighted to have welcomed you. Thank you so much for visiting our law school. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much for your answers. Thank you for volunteering uh, this afternoon. I really do apologize to the many people online uh, who volunteered Aaron in the class that we didn't get to you, but we hope that you use this as a reason to come to our law school. Why? so that we can continue the conversation. This is what happens in every class, right? In every class, I call on about 15 to 16 people. I sometimes want to call on 32 to 40. But the conversation gets so interesting that I'm not able to call on everyone, right? So the idea is to allow you to do the talking. Uh, I push you with the questions and so on, but that's my job. Thank you so much. We are so thrilled that you uh, are considering our law school. And you can always reach me. I'm available uh, over email um, if you've got any questions. And we have a quest we've got a request from you now. If you've got any questions about our curriculum, our first year curriculum, we ask that you ask those questions in English. Um, if the questions are about the admissions process, we ask that you do so in Chinese. Um, okay, that's from our admissions team. Thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you in my torts class next year. <laughs>